Hello, and thank you for joining us today from wherever you are in the world. My name is Reed Blakemore, Deputy Director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's fireside chat with founder and CEO of TechMet, Brian Minnell, on building secure and sustainable critical mineral supply chains. In advance of this in November's COP meetings in Glasgow, increasingly ambitious climate goals demand an unprecedented scaling of transition mineral production in order to manufacture and deploy sufficient clean and renewable energy technologies. Earlier this year, the International Energy Agency projected a fourfold increase in demand for key transition minerals by 2040 in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, as well as a six-fold increase to reach global net zero goals by 2050. Yet care must be taken to ensure supply chains are secure, sustainable, and resilient. Considerable investment is still needed to ensure sufficient mineral supplies are brought to market, with more and with more and more countries recognizing the role mineral supply chains will play in the green economy of the future, secure mineral supply chains are increasingly entering the realm of geopolitics and national security. As a major market for and significant potential source of these minerals, the United States must do its utmost, alongside its partners and allies, to secure critical mineral supply chains and enhance their sustainability, placing such issues at the forefront of energy transition policies. Consecutive U.S. administrations have now raised the bar to secure mineral supply chains, and this is why we're excited to welcome Brian, uh, which, which just who, whose firm TechMet just received a groundbreaking equity investment from the Development Finance Corporation to bolster its efforts to secure, uh, to secure finance and ensure that sustainable critical mineral projects around the world are advancing our energy transition goals. Brian has more than 25 years of experience of uh, investing in and developing natural resources products across Africa, North America, and South America. And since founding TechMet in 2015, he has supported the development of projects that produce, process, and recycle technology medical metals critical to electric vehicles, renewable energy systems, and geographies ranging from Brazil to Canada to Rwanda and the United States. TechMet success is just one example of the public-private partnerships that will be critical to enabling the mineral and metal supply chains that underpin the clean energy transition. We're so thankful to have Brian with us at the tail end of his whirlwind trip to Washington to survey the forthcoming challenges and opportunities of an increasingly minerals dependent world. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. First, this session is being held on the record and you can follow us on Twitter using the handle at AC Global Energy. Second, throughout our discussion, you can submit questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. And I'll try and get to as many of these as I can, but we have a short and tight half hour window for our conversation today. Unfortunately, if you're joining us via live stream on YouTube or Twitter, you won't be able to submit questions. Now, Brian, thanks again for joining us. And to kick us off, I, I think the most useful way to start would be for you to give us a little bit of background on TechMed. You're right at the crux of the financing, sustainability, and geopolitical issues surrounding mineral supply chain. So please give us a sense of what TechMet does and the role you see it playing throughout the mineral supply chain as demand for key minerals and metals rapidly increases. Thanks very much, Reed, and, and, and many thanks for having me here and for focusing attention on this um, issue, which is a, a very, very much more pressing and important and urgent one than most players in the space, be they government agencies or end users of our metals and metal chemicals, yet adequately recognize. So TechMet, as I, as you mentioned, I set up as a private company um, four years ago now as a platform to invest in and build projects that produce or process or recycle what we call technology metals which are the primary metals and metal chemicals going into batteries, electric vehicles, renewable energy systems. So we have projects, we're building a, a, a substantial nickel cobalt project in Brazil, very low carbon footprint, very low environmental impact. Uh, we're busy expanding our tin and tungsten mines in Rwanda. Um, we've got a vanadium specialty chemicals business in Arkansas, which is the lowest cost producer in the world of high purity, vanadium chemicals as the electrolyte of vanadium redox flow batteries, which we believe will be one of the winners in grid scale battery storage um, to facilitate the next phase of renewable energy systems. Um, we, we have been the primary funder for much of the last two years of what has become the biggest lithium ion battery recycling company in North America that listed on the New York Stock Exchange. 
a few weeks ago called Lifecycle, which is at the forefront of recycling all formats and all chemistries of lithium ion batteries, which will become a multi tens of billions of dollars industry over the next um, over the coming years, which it has to do mm -hmm. um, both environmentally and in terms of uh, um, returning value to the pipeline to be con continue to make lithium ion batteries cheaper mm -hmm. and obviously displacing um, reliance on China for some of these key battery metals, which is another major theme of what we are doing and dedicated to play a role in. Um, we're also busy in rare earth metals processing, direct lithium extraction and other um, initiatives to add projects to our pipeline as we continue to scale. So we're a private company, we invest equity, we build dominant positions in projects around the world um, in these key metals, key technologies and geographies where we have a history and a knowledge and an experience uh, across Africa, South America, and North America. And as you say, part owned by the US government through the DFC, which puts us in a quite a unique position to hopefully play a valuable role in the US context to um, um, work with government agencies and private sector in the US to balance China's dominant position across these metals um, mm -hmm. and to add to the success of a energy transition that US leads globally. You mentioned that you know the equity investment from DFC places TechMet kind of right at uh, right in an interesting position in the U.S. story uh, as it you know pursues uh, its own future demands for uh, you know critical minerals up and down the critical minerals list that was released several years ago. You know, having just wrapped up uh, a week long you know, series of meetings with policymakers you know, on the Hill, in the executive branch, et cetera. You know, what are your key takeaways uh, from this past week? And, and, you know, looking ahead, how should policymakers continue to evolve uh, their approach to growing minerals demand? Um, the key takeaway from our dialogues and, and network in Washington is that there's been enormous progress in terms of the understanding and interest in the inputs into the energy transition. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's still a long way to go um, in order to turn that understanding, that data, that analysis, and that interest into coherent strategies that do what we need to do um, and have America at the forefront of what we need to do. And that's not going to happen without a very multifaceted um, public sector approach to this space. Um, that needs to be somewhat unprecedented with respect to what has gone before. It needs to be on a much bigger scale and much more imaginative and aggressive than there is presently a lot of thinking around how to do it mm -hmm. um, in order to do what we need to do. And our key challenge is to produce these metals in quantities way beyond that which has been done historically mm -hmm. and to do it in an ESG compliant and low carbon footprint manner mm -hmm. and to do it in a way where the supply pipeline is not completely dominated by Chinese interest, which is the case today. And mm -hmm. China's been, you know, executing a coherent program to secure the this control of the ingredients of the energy transition for the last 20 years while everybody else has been sleeping and therefore has essentially have essentially lost a war that they didn't know they were fighting till they lost it. And that's a massive national security issue. It's a massive US corporate competitiveness issue, um, and it's a massive global climate change issue. Mm -hmm. you, you, you pulled on a number of different threads there. I think I want to pull out over the next couple of minutes, but I think let's start with you know the point you made about this, the growing sense of scale and the amount of supply we're going to need to bring online. You know, so much of over the past, only in the past, you know, several years where the challenges of the critical mineral supply chain has really come to the forefront of uh, both the, you know, the foreign policy agenda in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the supply chain, but not a lot yet about exactly how much investment we're going to need in new mineral resources to bring sufficient supplies online. You know, from your position, you know, how significant is that current investment gap in your opinion? And, and what should the policymaking community be doing in partnership with the private sector, in, in your case in particular, uh, to fill that gap? Um, and then I think, you know, after, I'd love to hear you take that. And then I'd love to talk about ESG in particular, because I think that's another area where the financing of mineral resources really is 
uh, just now starting to gain a lot of steam. Oh. Now, the funding gap is enormous, and the need to bridge that gap is very, very urgent. You know, mining and metal processing on scale are projects that require are capital intensive and have long lead times. Mm -hmm. The demand growth is exponential and is unstoppable and inescapable. And therefore, we don't need billions of dollars. We need hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years to produce the materials sufficient for a successful for successful climate change mitigation for mm -hmm. continual growth of the renewable energy systems and, and the electric vehicle industry. So it, it, it's quite daunting. And, and I can't overemphasize how big a challenge it is mm -hmm. and how the extent to which our industry needs to totally reinvent itself um, in terms of scale and in terms of ESG and carbon footprint in order to meet this challenge and the extent to which we're not going to do it without a lot of government support. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not one to, you know, put out a begging bowl to the public sector. You know, I'm a private sector guy and the market will to some extent take care of itself. But if the market's allowed to take care of itself without government, U.S government and the support of US allies, um, we'll have an energy transition that will firstly be retarded by inputs that will be command much, much, much higher prices. I'm talking about multiples of present prices in order to stimulate the supply to meet the demand, which will be retarded and delayed. Um, and in parallel, it will continue to be dominated by supply pipelines controlled by Chinese interests. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is not doesn't create a health in arm in my view it doesn't create a healthy and stable world and it radically undermines us position as a preeminent technological industrial and commercial power over the next 10 20 and 50 years you know this is going to be one of the key definers of global competitiveness and the global geopolitical landscape so let's turn to that question now i think this is a good opportunity to turn to that question of geopolitics uh you know the not only are we looking at mineral supply chains as a core part of our uh, our energy transition goals and our energy tra transition technology deployment, uh, but these mineral supply chains for the longest time have also been a core part of any number of defense and telecommunications technology. So we're really almost looking at a doubling down of the role of critical minerals in our national security positioning. It, you, you mentioned that left unchanged, you know, that that supply chain geopolitical status quo will likely uh, put the United States as well as its partners and allies at a significant industrial disadvantage. That said, what levers uh, do you think the United States has uh, both as a as a unitary actor, but also in partnership with a range of very, very equally concerned partners and allies around the world? Uh, to ensure that growing dependence on mineral supply change is managed in a way which limits risks to national security, industrial industrial competitiveness, but as well as climate and sustainability goals per some of the pricing risks that you mentioned just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it needs to be a, a multi-pronged um, approach. Um, certainly, the U.S. needs to work much more effectively with its allies in order to do this on a global scale. Mm -hmm. um, because because the answer, some of the solution is at home. You know, you can become more efficient with respect to licensing of domestic production and processing without mm -hmm. compromising environmental and governance standards, which we don't want to do. Um, but a lot of the solution is global. So a lot of the solution is working with Australia and Canada and India and Japan um, and the United Kingdom and, and, and Europe um, to jointly um, engage in, in the challenges that we all have to face. Mm -hmm. um, from a point of view of what tools within the US government system can be deployed, um, obviously the tools, as you mentioned in your introduction, are much less user-friendly than the tools available to the Chinese government who can deploy private and public sector financial and technical resources much more effectively in pursuit of long-term st national strategic goals. However, in the US, there are precedents and there are mechanisms and institutions within the state structures that are being deployed. You know, DFC has invested in us as TechNet. That's a fantastic start. It was innovative. It was enterprising and visionary, and it certainly made a big difference to us. And hopefully it's a precedent that can be 
duplicated many, many times over with us and with other players. Um, US Exim Bank can play a role. The Department of Defense's lending program to play, can play a role. The Department of you know, Energy's lending program can play a role. So there are multiple angles that can be pursued. However, they need to be coordinated, driven, and funded on a much, much, much bigger scale than they have been up to now. You know, there's some precedent with respect to the role of oil and gas in the 70s and 80s and the extent to which US government um, tools were deployed to, to lessen, you know, to increase energy independence. But it's different. You know, we now have a major global power who controls the supply pipeline of these materials. That wasn't the case when we were worried about kind of Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Iran. It's a different ballgame. Okay? We're now worried about China's control of processing capacity and China's overwhelmingly dominant position with respect to sources of supply of feedstock and raw materials, be it in Chile, be it in the Congo, be it in Australia and elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, it, one of the items you, you touched on, which I think is a, is a particularly hard circle to square in a lot of ways, is, you know, you, you're, you're, you are talking about a whole lot of, you know, uh, engagement and coordination needed across uh, I think, you know, a list of minerals and metals and steps throughout the supply chains of each of those different minerals and metals. That's that I don't think gets enough credit for exactly how diverse those those supply chain steps in between different minerals classes actually are. That always brings up in my mind a question of uh, prioritization and, you know, how in a world where we see regularly in D.C. Uh, that we have limited policy capital to deploy at any given moment. How how do you think the United States needs to be thinking about, you know, prioritizing its actions in the most effective way? What are the, I guess, you know, again, easy wins and low hanging fruit are, are rather overused terms for a severe challenge such as this. But what are those kind of next steps that, you know, I think the U.S. government in particular should be looking at? No, it's a tough one because it's so diverse and one has to tackle all of these things. And if you fail in one of them, it's the successes in others is less relevant and valuable. So I think where the perhaps the, the easy or the easier wins are is stimulating domestic lithium supply mm -hmm. and production and processing, which you have the potential to do in the US, which isn't the case for most for, for nickel or isn't the case to a large extent for cobalt or rare earth metals to, 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 to a significant extent. Um, Recycling is very, very important, and there's a lot that government can do to encourage and resource the recycling ecosystem in order to return a lot more of these metals to the manufacturing pipeline domestically. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a very, very important area which is going to grow a lot and be very, very valuable and, and strategically significant. Um, there's, some big, there's some very important countries in the world in the context of certain of these strategic minerals that the US from a State Department and military point of view need to be much more successfully engaged in, many of which are difficult, like the Congo, where China has built an overwhelmingly dominant position when which accounts for, you know, 65, 70% of global cobalt mm -hmm. supply. Um, Latin America, U.S. backyard, you know, Chile, Argentina, Peru, very Brazil, very important countries for a lot of these strategic resources. And again, in environments in which China has been uh, not alone, but allowed to, to build a very strong position while everybody else was, you know, had their eyes closed as mm -hmm. they have in Africa and elsewhere in the world. So there are a lot of geographies and a lot of projects and a lot of particular metal categories that need to be prioritized. It's not like two or three. Mm. I think one item you touched on as an immediate next step is this is the domestic production question, which I think, you know, is is really tricky. Um, and we have a question from the audience. And I'd like to remind everybody as we have about 10 minutes remaining, if you if you'd like to submit a question, use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen below. But we have a question that talks about, you know, how frequently you have local opposition right associated with with domestic mining and processing activities uh you know we talk and often about you know nimby uh in you know not in my backyard being a being a big rather big issue how should the private sector you know uh it, private sector in addition to policymakers think about the balance of national needs and local you know 
just very, very important and justifiable local demands that these projects are sustainable, that these projects don't impact the, uh, the, local, uh, the local flora and fauna too negatively, but also don't increase emissions for local cities, et cetera. How do you balance those needs and how do you communicate that to the public? We have to do as an industry a much better job at firstly educating the public um, with respect to the fact that mining can be low environmental impact, it can be highly responsible from a social point of view, and it can be low carbon footprint. It's not easy and it's a challenge in, in the case of some projects, but it can be done. And that's what we as TechMet seek to do in all of our projects and all of our investments. And that's what the industry needs to do because to have a successful energy transition and for the GMs and Teslas and VWs of this world to you know, claim to have uh, uh, electric vehicles that are, are correctly, you know, with ingredients that are correctly sourced from an ESG and low carbon footprint point of view, mm -hmm. we need a very different industry. We can, we're doing it every day. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is an educational thing. The other side of it is the fact that, as you say, from a national security interest point of view, from a successful energy transition point of view and a future sustainable, clean world um, perspective, you know, we just need to mine and process many multiples of the present global supply of these metals. There's no way around it. So mm -hmm. it's all very nice to say we want a clean future, but we don't want to think about where the ingredients come from. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't have that luxury. We have to do it well. We have to do it better than a lot of the industry and particularly the Chinese projects done in the past. And that costs and that requires government support to, to in some way mitigate some of the those costs in order to be globally competitive and scale to the extent we need to. Hmm. You know, you actually you touched on throughout that thread. It's it's the importance of, you know, almost communicating that these minerals can be produced and the supply chain can be made more sustainable. Um, and how, in a way, a creating a sustainable mineral supply chain is an important lever to hedge against, uh, you know, concentration that currently exists elsewhere uh, throughout, you know, the mineral supply chains, China well, being one of them. And some of it is government regulation from an import mm -hmm. point of view. Some of it will be driven by the market and by the end users. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully we'll have a situation where the GMs and Teslas and VWs of this world require a supply pipeline that is not only scaling to meet their EV rollout needs, but has mm -hmm. a fully you know, compliant and independently verified ESG credentials and low carbon footprint across the pipeline of supply. And mm -hmm. that will give us as TechMet and people like us, not only preferential access to market, but potential premium value in that market relative to sources that are not ESG compliant, low carbon footprint and independent of control by Chinese and other competitors, which makes the growth of the Teslas of this world very fragile. Yeah. And, and you mentioned one, I mean, again, this might be a bit too wonky for you know this particular half hour conversation, but I think the challenge of verification of a, you know, how, what do you, you know, if we're going to expect a, or if we want in the future for our GMs, our Teslas to be able to say, hey, we have a sustainable mineral supply chain that, that you know, creates the vehicle that's on the road, you know, that requires a number of verification steps from your position you know, how is, what tools are out there to verifiably say, you know, this, this, uh, this ore was produced from a sustainable source, it passed through a sustainable supply chain. You hear a lot about blockchain as a solution there. What are, what are you hearing on the verification question? There's a lot of solutions and they're confusing and complicated and overlapping. And a lot of them don't work very well. So one of our challenges as an industry is to create uniform and properly um, uh, verified and and um, clearly defined systems of categorization and um, certification of origin and compliance. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of work being done on that. And, and we're making a lot of progress. But as an industry, we're certainly not there yet. And there's a lot more work to do. Mm -hmm. The you know, with, with an eye to the eye to the clock, I, I you know, I, we have two questions from the audience that I just want to briefly allow you to touch on and then kind of give you the opportunity to send us off one last message. Um, but one is is kind of related to or actually closely related. And that's what are the big game changing technologies or, or business practices that are over the horizon that we that might change how we think about these mineral supply chains, at least in terms of the production and processing of minerals? We have one question in the chat that specifically talks about deep sea mining. 
Um, and another another question that references recycling and the role recycling has to play. And I know TechMet's deeply involved in that space. You know, when you look at you know the what has been a rapidly changing industry just in the past several years, are things like recycling and deep sea mining things that we should really try and uh, explore? What else are we missing as a part of that innovation picture? No, recycling and recycling technologies such as that which we've supported through Lifecycle are enormously important. It's going to be a 10, 20, 50 billion dollar industry over the next 10 and 20 years, and it's going to make a big contribution to environmentally sound and responsible supply of battery metals into the US and, and global um, supply chain. Um, so that's very important. It's growing life cycle. Obviously, we, we you know we expect to be one of the winners on that. Um, uh, but there, 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 there will be other. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other solutions are mining, doing more of what we do, but doing it better, doing it bigger, doing it cleaner in terms of mining and processing of these metals. Deep sea mining, mining, you know, asteroids or whatever else people dream about, you know, may play a role at some point in the future, but it's pretty remote. It's pretty, you know, it's very expensive. It's got big environmental issues. And I wouldn't Personally, I'm not very excited about it. You know, maybe in 30, 20 years time, I'll be proved wrong, but it's certainly not going to be a significant contributor in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the next 10 years being a critical uh, period to bring on that massive supply if we want to, you know, meet our goals just by 2040 alone. Um, you know, we have we have one, one more question from the audience, and then I want to give you an opportunity to, to close us out here which is specifically, and this is again, probably an Atlantic Council bias coming through, uh, given our transatlantic heritage somewhat, but you know, looking to Europe, right? Which has, you know, in, in the range of partners and allies, you know, uh, available to the United States, has a really, really robust, you know, battery supply chain strategy. How can the US specifically consider working more closely with Europe on these issues? And, and what are the, the shared opportunities that might exist? There are a lot, and, and the network in, in producing countries and the ecosystem in the United Kingdom and, and France and elsewhere are ones that can be very complementary to US um, objectives. So there's a lot that needs to be done to work more closely and more effectively with allies, there's no question. The uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll cap it there. I think just to give you an opportunity, one big bucket question to wrap us up here is, we hit a lot of different points. There's, you know, there's the, there's the need to create you know, to improve the sustainability of the overall supply chain and where the United States and partners and allies might actually be able to use that as an advantage in its own right in kind of increasing the maturity of the market in a way. There's the geopolitical drivers here, which I think are have been well trod throughout, you know, both in this conversation and elsewhere. You know, when you look to the next, you know, it's clear that the next five, you know, two years, actually, I would actually, next two years of policy in this space is going to be absolutely important. You know, what are the things I think that you're looking for uh, that'll be strong signposts that the United States is moving in the right direction in terms of securing and, you know, increasing the resiliency of these supply chains? Yeah. No, I'd like to, in the context of that theme, end with a call to arms. You know, on, on one hand, TechMet, you know, we're dedicated to play a role. We want to build bigger projects. We want to deploy and invest a few billion dollars over the next few years, you know, across these metals and technologies in a clean and, and responsible manner in alignment with US interest. Mm -hmm. But we really need to be part of they, The world needs 500 tech nets yesterday. Yeah. And to get that, we need not only government and other mining companies to reinvent themselves in the space, but sources of capital, you know, all these ESG and impact and climate change funds need to realize that, you know, it's nice investing in autonomous driving, you know, technology startups, but none of it's going to mean anything without the ingredients that build these systems. So we really need the private sector, the public sector and our industry to go to a whole nother level if we're going to succeed in having a non-Chinese controlled successful energy con you know, transition and clean, sustainable world for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to, a great place to stop. Uh, you know, a call to arms that we need, you know, a hundred other companies just like TechMet is, uh, is, a, is a great message for a founder and CEO of a TechMet to, to end with, uh, even if it seems like just more capital and competition is getting put into the space, which we all certainly need. Uh, that wraps up our time for today. I want to thank you, Brian, uh, for joining us. This was hugely insightful. Uh, you know, we look forward to being able to host you again soon uh, because I think you've laid out a really compelling, you know, 
set of issues and pathways for policymakers, business leaders, uh, and think tankers like myself to consider as we look at these critical mineral challenges. Um, as we close, you know, obviously, you know, thank you, Brian, but I also like to thank uh, several of my colleagues here at the Atlantic Council, Patty Ryan, Lauren Holland, Jasper Gillardi, and Roger Morales, who absolutely were critical to pulling this event together. Uh, when we, you know, just kind of sat down briefly with TechMet uh, just last week and kind of learned, wow, we got to we got to really, you know, highlight what you guys are doing in this space. Um, and finally, for those who might have joined us late, the video and recap for this event are going to be found on the Atlantic Council webpage. Uh, and I'd encourage all of you to continue to follow what the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center is doing uh, on critical mineral supply chains and the geopolitics of the energy transition. Uh, we have a lot planned in this space over the next several months, and we hope you can be more and more involved. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you all again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, stay safe, everybody.